Welcome to Writer Writer Pants on Fire, where authors talk about things that never happened to people who don't exist. I'm your host, Mindy McGinnis. You can check out my books and social media at mindymcginnis.com and visit the Writer Writer Pants on Fire blog at writerwriterpantsonfire.com. If you enjoy the podcast, please consider donating. Even if you toss me five bucks, it makes me feel better and as if you actually care about me. Visit www.writerwriterpantsonfire.com and click on support the blog to donate either by giving to GoFundMe through PayPal, or you can support me by buying me a coffee, which trust me, is dearly needed. Today's guest is Melanie Thorne who earned her M.A. in creative writing from the University of California, Davis. Her thesis there was the first draft of what later became her debut novel, Hand Me Down. Melanie joined me today to talk about presenting a memoir through the veil of fiction and how the reading audience sometimes gets a thrill out of the consumption of another's pain. Killer scorpions, giant crocodiles, and magical amulets. Ancient Egypt is nothing like Jagger Jones imagined. When he and his little sister fall 3,000 years back in time, they must solve supernatural riddles and save the royal family. If they pull it off, Jagger might return to Chicago a hero. Jagger Jones and the Mummy's Ink by Malena Evans. Your novel, Hand Me Down, is about your childhood, yet it's not written as a memoir. So why did you make that choice? When I was writing my book, it was about 2005. So the James Frey thing had just happened. It was just such a mess that I didn't want to be part of that. So Mm -hmm. that was part of my initial decision was just, this is going to be easier for me. And then once I started writing, I actually found that I loved the choice of fiction because I was able to change things. I was able to consolidate characters and crunch Mm. timelines and move things around. And it just gave me, it gave me a freedom that I hadn't really thought about or expected. It was such a lovely way to write, to not have to worry about sticking to what was quote true and real. I can imagine because I know that even in writing pure fiction, purely fiction, I have people ask me all the time, which character are you? And I'm right. Like, well, it's <laughs> it's fiction. I'm not any of these characters, yet I am in some way all of them. You Each know? of them, right. Yeah, yes. exactly. And so I would think then when writing something that is so intensely personal and based on a true life experience, not marketing a, as a memoir, you do have those liberties that you're able to take. But I also, I just have people all the time And again, I'm just writing 100% fiction that'll be like, is that character supposed to be me? And I'm like, no. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I don't think about you that much. (laughs) It's funny the way that people either think that a character who is not them is them or they don't recognize characters that are them Mm. uh, as themselves. My aunt said uh, she didn't like her name. She didn't like the name that I had given her character. And she said there were a couple of things in the book where she was like, I would never do that. And <laughs> um, I had to say, well, she's not you exactly. I mean, right. she's based on you. But again, those liberties allowed me to add extra character traits or better the story in ways that I think I would not have been able to do had I been writing a memoir. Had I written a memoir, my book would have done better. Okay. Um, because people like true stories being told as true, whereas a lot of the comments on my book were like, this is so real, and that means it's too depressing, and they didn't want to read it. So it's just sort of interesting to me, whereas people, if it's real, it's depressing, but it's also becomes voyeuristic in a way that people, I think, respond to. It does. So worried about the James Frey mess that it didn't occur to me that there would also be some potential cons in publishing it as fiction. So, I mean, again, I think there's good and bad always, but I think in the writing of it, I was so, so happy that I did not decide to call it nonfiction. I want to go back to the James Frey for listeners that maybe don't remember. James Frey had written a book called A Million Little Pieces, and it was all about addiction and recovery and all from the point of view of an addict. And correct me if I'm wrong, but he did present that as memoir, didn't he? He presented it as fiction first. So the story that I know is that he tried to sell it as fiction 
and it couldn't, it wouldn't sell. Nobody was interested in it. And then when he called it nonfiction, everyone wanted it. Mm. So it got published as a memoir, nonfiction. And then it came out that it was mostly fictionalized. I think that also says a lot about the publishing industry and sort of what I was just saying is that voyeuristic aspect. Like nobody wanted it when it was called fiction. But as soon as somebody said, oh, this is a true story, people wanted to, to publish it. On the larger scale, it just, you mentioned before, it says so much about human beings and our voyeuristic <laughs> nature. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and I've got to say, as somebody, I just listened recently to The Glass Castle, which I had never mm. read before. And of course, everyone was talking about it. And it is a memoir about uh, Jeanette Walls and her life growing up and having a pretty rough and tumble life and parents that were more children than parents. Knowing it was a true story, listening to it has a different effect on you. I was distinctly uncomfortable in a way that I would not have been if it were presented as a novel. For example, there's a scene when they are staying with, I believe it's their grandparents, and the brother is almost molested or nearly mm. molested by the grandmother. And listening to it, of course, is upsetting on any level, but listening to it knowing that it was true and that the yeah. author is telling this about something that she witnessed and was there for and is writing about her own blood family, it just puts you in knowing then, of course, and then your mind goes everywhere where it's like, well, the, did the parents know? Like, did they know this right. was going on? And she even infers, well, maybe this happened to my dad and that's why he is the way he is. And there's this whole domino effect that you get in two seconds of a scene yeah. where it just makes you so uncomfortable. I mean, obviously, we're not ignorant. We know that child molestation happens, fictional or right. real. But the idea that someone is telling you about this in a packaged commodity, it just makes me uncomfortable because I am a consumer now of someone's pain, I think, is where sure. I'm at with that. But I think a lot of people really like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they like being consumers of other people's pain because it makes them feel better about their lives mm -hmm. or themselves or whatever it is. Um, I think that's pretty common. And I think you're right that it does affect you differently when you know something is true. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what that, like for me, it doesn't so much, like I get super attached to fictional characters as if they were real. Mm -hmm. And so that distinction, and because I write such semi-autobiographical fiction, the line between fiction and nonfiction for me is always really blurred. So I'm not sure that that same thing happens to me at the same level as other people, mm -hmm. but I know that it's a really common thing. I think in one way, that's part of what makes The Office work so much as a comedy. That's interesting. Because yeah. all of the situations, yeah. it's like what makes you laugh is that you're uncomfortable. You're doing <laughs> an uncomfortable laugh when you're watching <laughs> some of those scenes. And the reason why it's uncomfortable is because it's so real. It's so awkward and terrible. I think you're totally right. I can't watch shows like I've seen some of The Office and some of it's really funny. But I that kind of humor just makes me cringe and mm -hmm. I can't. I don't like it. But I think that's exactly why I don't like it because it's so real. It is. Um, it cuts you. Yeah, it really does. And all I do, I'm like, oh, that's funny, but it's also so awful. I don't want to watch it. Anymore. Exactly. <laughs> As someone who enjoys horror movies, I cover <laughs> my face and look away from the office more than I do <laughs> something horribly graphic or disgusting because I'm, because it's too hard. It's too hard. It, <laughs> that's really it is like it's it's almost like a horror movie right because you can see what's coming you feel the awkwardness and you're like oh god it's just gonna get worse <laughs> uh, <laughs> a real horror movie they're rare but if you can do it okay you've got me you know yeah then it's actually scary the changeling with angelina jolie that's one that just popped into my mind. But the thing that makes it so gripping is that it's based on a true story. So, like, it just brings us back to this whole idea. Right. You're watching this movie and you're thinking about this woman. I don't know if you know the story, but it's a woman who's no. her son disappeared. And she it was I think it's in like the 30s. She was a single mother. And so she automatically didn't have a lot of clout. And she went to the police and she's like, dude, my son disappeared. He's gone. And they went out and, like, tried to find him, and they couldn't do it. 
and they found this other kid and they're like, hey, here's your son. And they just <gasps> gave oh her God. this kid. And she's like, that is not my son. And they were like, <sighs> yeah, it is. Whoa. Yeah. And it's a true story. And it's all about how the police just were like, yeah, this woman is crazy. And we did find her son and he's there now. And we don't know what her problem is. Wow. That sounds really fascinating. Yes. And the true story, like what actually happened to her son was that he was killed by a serial <gasps> killer. And, and she really was just given someone, some other random kid. She was just given a kid. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's. Did she raise him? Did she, like. I honestly oh, can't no, remember. I, just... I honestly can't remember if she kept the changeling or not. And wow. I don't know how true to life the movie is. Right. But yeah. I know that that movie really gutted me because, for one thing, they also show. I forget the serial killer's name. I would have to look it up. I'm going to look it up right now. He got kids. He just, you know, collected children. And mm. The way that he did it was that he used his own, I believe, nephew. And he took him with him. So, and he would be like, hey, you need a ride. And the kids saw that there was a kid with him. And they were like, oh, right. okay, so it's safe. Um, let me. Look That's horrible. Up. Oh, I know. It's terrible. The One of the things that bothers me so much is that, you know, it was true. The killings are known as the Wineville Chicken Coop murders because he Wine. kept the kids he kept the kids in the Aww. chicken coop. Yeah, it was terrible. It was a film made in 2008, says partly based on the Wineville Chicken Coop murders. The huh. film centers around Christine Collins with her struggles against the LAPD and her search to find her son Walter. You got to watch wow. it or maybe you yeah. can't, I don't know. <laughs> Coming up, the impact of writing about such a private topic on the author's personal relationships. Authors, are you looking for a surefire way to sell more copies of your book? Teachers are a huge market for writers. YA and middle grade author Rachel Alpine can help you reach them with her Common Core Aligned Teacher Guides. Rachel has over 15 years of teaching experience and knows just what teachers want and need to be able to use your book in their classroom. She's designed over 75 teacher guides for published authors and would love to create one for you. Check out her guides on her website and use the contact tab for a quote at www.rachelalpine. That's R-A-C-H-E-L-E-A-L-P-I-N-E dot com. So back to your work. Hand me down. It's obviously deeply personal, even though you did layer it with fiction, but it delves into your life, but also that of your sister and your parents. So yeah. how do you sort through that in your private life? How does the publication of the book impact those relationships? Another good question. Um, with my sister, it's been fine. She read the book and a couple of times said things like, oh, I, f I forgot about this or I forgot what a jerk dad was. I think she was kind of happy to see some of the things that we had both been, you know, family secrets. You know, you, your parents try to tell you that things didn't happen the way you remember them. So I think it was kind of nice for my sister to read my perception of things and realize that some of her memories were also true. With my parents, I had already stopped speaking to my father, so mm -hmm. that wasn't an issue. And then with my mom, that was sort of the hardest struggle because she – is sort of the villain in the book. You know, she does a lot of awful things. And I think it was really hard for her. I know it was really hard for her to read, but her way of coping was to pretend that it was all fiction mm. and just ignore anything that actually happened. Mm. So her response to me after she read the book was something like, well, I know that these two things didn't happen. And that was it. Like, that was basically all she said. I will say it hasn't ruined anything. I think what I was hoping for was some kind of apology sure. or some kind of acknowledgement of the mistakes she had made. And I didn't get that. She didn't write me off either. You know, mm -hmm. she didn't decide that I had done this horrible thing and that she wasn't going to talk to me anymore. So I feel like it's kind of something that just exists between us that we don't really talk about, which is sort of the case with what happened. Getting kicked out of my house, her marriage to sex offender, all of that is just stuff that we as a family don't really talk about. So Right. right. So it didn't actually change much. <laughs> no, but I think that was sort of a disappointment for me because I on some level was hoping for some change and mm -hmm. didn't get it. And mm -hmm. so that was that was tough, I think, for me also just in the couple of years after the book came out kind of waiting for something to happen and finally accepting that it wasn't going to. 
I mean, it helped me to just say those things out loud, but I don't know that my mom will ever be able to acknowledge her role in all of that. Mm -hmm. My mom is very much a person who ignores things. Sure. (laughs) So she just does that and she just pretends it didn't happen. And more recently, my same stepdad, his behavior escalated. And a couple of years ago, he attacked his girlfriend. He raped and tried to murder her. And now, so now he's in, he's in prison for the rest of his life. (laughs) Oh my God. Um, Which is great. Uh, and, and his girlfriend survived. She's okay. But my mom's response to that was even like, why do you care about this? This has Mm -hmm. nothing to do with us. And I was like, he lived with us for, you know, 15 years. This is still pretty scary. And she just completely ignored it. So Mm. that's, that's the way she deals with things. And that's something I've just had to accept. Well, and a lot of people do. A lot of people, the trauma is just too much. And so they're yeah. like, no, it didn't happen. Honestly, right. and this is a controversial opinion, but th- people that are like Sandy Hook deniers, for me, I really think that it is like self-defense in some ways. It's so horrible and it's so terrible that they have to believe it didn't happen. Right. Because if it actually happened, it could happen again. And, and it's can't... too much pain. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's a lot of people's way of coping with trauma. You just, you put it in a box and you don't think about it and you pretend it didn't happen and you just try to live your life the best you can. I mean, what I've learned in therapy is that, you you know, that doesn't actually work. You can't just put it in a box. It it definitely pops out in weird ways and ways you wouldn't expect later and affects your behavior and the way that you look at the world. But for a lot of people, they can't go back and open that box. So no, it's too much. It's too much. It's too much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting to me that you had the courage to use that story and to obviously for your own self to write it out and do what you did with it. But then also knowing that it could impact relationships with others. If your mother had become so upset and been like, I'm never speaking to you again. Would you have still called it worth it? Who? that is a really good question. I think so. I think so. I think I had to write it. I think, I mean, I tried to write other things in grad school. I kept trying to write more fictionalized stories and it just didn't work. Like Mm -hmm. this story had to come out of me. And there was absolutely no way to not tell that story. And the lucky thing about writing your first book is that even though you hope it will be published, there's a part of you that thinks it never will be. So, right. Um, so there was a safety in that too. I didn't really, really expect anyone to ever actually read it. That made it a little bit easier in the writing. But yeah, I do think that even if my mom had said, yeah, I'm never talking to you again, I would have been sad. Mm-hmm. But I think that for me, it was such an important thing to do for my progress and my growth and my health. I don't think I would have regretted it. No one's ever asked me that. That's such an interesting question. I've never really thought about that. But yeah, I think I think it was something I had to do. I think I would have I would have done it no matter what. Lastly, the fickleness of memory and what Melanie is working on now. Set against the backdrop of the religious tensions in Northern Ireland, All the Walls of Belfast features two teens with stark religious differences and histories that must be overcome. An endearing story full of pain, love, and strength. All the Walls of Belfast by Sarah J. Carlson. So when it comes to writing memoir, even though this was in fact fiction, you are revisiting things from your past and painful things. Even though you were writing through the lens of fiction, were you inquiring with others about their experiences of the same moments just to check your own memory or to see if there was a different perspective? I'm just curious about that because, you know, as I get older, I I do see how people interpret the same event differently often, even people that were yeah. in the same place. So I'm just Absolutely. curious about that. Did you check in with others and see how they interpreted events? Or because of the fact that you were doing this through the veil of fiction, were you not as concerned about that? Oh my God, you have good questions. So I didn't check in with people memories so much. I had journals. Mm-hmm. I had really, really specific day-to-day journals with like quotes from people. So I took a lot of my memories from those, Mm -hmm. um, because I didn't trust, you know, memory is fallible and I I didn't fully trust all of my present day adult memories. So I definitely went back and used a lot of my journals. And I definitely also asked my sister a few things about Mm -hmm. what she remembered. 
But I also didn't want to check in with other people because I felt like their memories would be skewed. And I also didn't really want to tell my mom I was writing it and I didn't talk to my dad. So I didn't really check in. But I think that I felt really safe in my memories because of my journals, Mm -hmm. because I had written such detailed accounts of what people said and Mm -hmm. what was happening that I I did really trust that. But I also did really try to think about other people's perspectives. Like, for example, with my mom, I think a lot of my processing happened in the revision stages where I was trying to, I think the first draft, my mom was just a bitch. Mm -hmm, (laughs) And then in the second draft, I had to make her a more complex person and have reasons why she was making these decisions and things that would make sense in a book. And so that people you know, I didn't want her to be a villain because right. I don't think she actually is a villain. She's just a flawed person. Mm-hmm. So, so it was a lot of that. And same with my dad and other people in my life thinking about what they were going through at that time or the reasons that they made those decisions. So I, I definitely thought about it, but maybe not so much checking in with them. Well, I think it's fascinating. You have that source material because the diary, you know, you have your immediate information that you wrote down as it happened. because You don't have to rely on fallible memory because you have your experiences of it already recorded and like just absolutely a a goldmine of source material there. (laughs) It really is. It's been helping a lot, uh, especially with the thing I'm working on now. It's sort of about my past, but it was kind of funny reading reading about events that some things I remembered completely. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember this. And then other things I had absolutely no recollection of whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of interesting reading those pieces because I I knew it had happened and I knew it was real, but I had no memory of it. And so even just that process of like, how does memory work in my own brain was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Memory is almost alarming. It is. And the way our brains, I mean, every time you, you essentially pull a memory out of your brain, you are changing it because yep. you're looking at it from your new perspective and then you put it back and it's different. It is fascinating. Memory is just incredibly interesting. Our brains are amazing. Yes. And, and also weird and kind of stupid sometimes. Oh, but- <laughs> weird and, and like not reliable at all. I mean, that's exactly. the thing. So one of the things with memory that really gets me is you were saying you would read a diary, you would read something that you had written about. And you were like, dude, I don't remember that at all. Like, it's almost (laughs) for you, like you're reading fiction or a novel because you're like, Oh, wow, like, that's fascinating. And I've had those experiences. I didn't keep a diary. I wish I had when I was a teen. But people will tell me things like, you know, if you're hanging out with old friends, and they'll be telling the story, and I'm in it. And I was there. And they'll even be (laughs) like, sometimes it's even about me. They're like, yeah, remember when you did this? And it's like this thing that I totally should remember. Like, dude, are you sure that was me? And they're like, yeah. And they'll have like pictures. And I'm like, dude, I don't remember that. (laughs) And it's not like I was drinking or anything. Like, it's just something that happened that somebody else remembered in detail because it was funny or like whatever. And, And I don't remember it happening at all. I mean, I've done a little bit of research in memories, the ones that have strong emotional components, either anger or sadness or happiness or whatever, those are the memories that tend to stick with us for longer. Mm -hmm. So like even just when you drive somewhere, if you're driving somewhere that you go all the time, you probably don't remember the 10 minutes it took you to get from point A to point B because you're just on autopilot. Like our brains are so amazing. The Mm -hmm. way that that we work and it has to make space for other things. So it gets rid of those memories that are not important to us or that it thinks it decides are not important. However, it decides that. Yeah. It like cleans the cash. Exactly. Exactly. It is creepy. Can you imagine being like 80 years old and having 80 years of, I can't even imagine having 80 years of memory that you don't have. (laughs) Yeah. I guess that's true that you don't have access to. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's bizarre. Like what you're saying about driving is a great example. When I, um, when I was in college, I had a job like at home on the weekend. So I would drive home and it was like a, like a 45 minute drive and I would daydream while I was driving. Yeah. And I had one moment in particular where I got home and I was like, dude, what the hell? I mean, like, (laughs) how did I get here? How did I get here? Like I literally didn't. And I'm like, is this dangerous? Should I be driving with my head that much in the clouds? And I'm like, no, I mean, I guess this is normal. Of course, I was only like 19 years old. I didn't understand yet that this is something that you do, like your muscle memory will drive a car. 
And that's bizarre. But it is weird though. Exactly that you get to a place and you don't remember getting there and you're like, was that safe? Was my brain actually paying attention, but you've made it. Okay. So you must've been fine. So back to your sister, you've told me before that one of the most common reactions that readers have after they read hand me down is to ask you how your sister is doing. (laughs) (laughs) And a lot of the book deals with how is the older sibling, you are the one looking out for your sister and her well being and intervening and doing all of the like parenting work in a lot of ways. So is it ironic to you that the initial reaction that readers have is to then ask you how your sister is doing? <laughs> I'd laugh so loud when I read that question. I was like, that's such an amazing question. I, it's so funny because I it hadn't ever occurred to me because that was sort of my job for my whole childhood is to take mm-hmm. care of my sister. So it seems like a It's like someone asking me how my job is going, essentially. Uh, So it felt really normal. But then when I read that question, I started thinking about it. And I was like, yeah, actually, that is a little weird. No one asked how I was. No. (laughs) (laughs) Which actually isn't entirely true. A lot of people would say things to me like, you're so brave or you're so strong. And I think part of asking about my sister, too, is the fact that she wasn't there. And, you know, if people were at book events or whatever with me, they could see that I was there and I was alive and relatively healthy. And so I think that was a big part of it. And I think that one of the things my book does, or I hope it does is really establishes that sister love. And Mm -hmm. I actually, I think it's great that readers are so invested in that sister love that they want to know how this fictional, you know, to them, the person that's this fictional sister is doing. I think that's really sweet. And that actually always makes me feel really good about my writing. Mm Mm-hmm. I think it's it's kind of fun for them, too, in a way, because as I was saying, since it is layered with fiction, it's like they get to check in on a character and they know the answer is actually true or right. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you. So I'll tell you this funny story. My I have a half sister who's she's 18. I went up to see her not too long ago and one of her friends had read my book and was like super fangirling over me. It was really sweet. We went to dinner and I have this, um, I sort of have issues with like keeping my hands busy. So I was just ripping up like the straw wrapper. Yeah, I do that and, too. And apparently I do that in the book. My character does that in the book. And she was so excited. She's like, oh my God, Liz does that in the book. You're just like Liz. It was, it was like, the, it was exactly that though, right? Like these characters for her. And then she got to hang out with me and it was like the sequel to the book and she got to see that all the characters were doing well and had lives and were married. And it was exactly that. And I think it was really fun for her. And then it was fun for me too, just to have someone be so, it was, it was such a cute, cute night. Um, and she was so excited. So I brought her a signed copy of my book the next time I went up. Characters become people you really care about. So aside from writing, you're also an editor and a writing coach and you teach at the UCLA writers extension program. So I do. when you're teaching, I can't even imagine because people ask me all the time if I have an interest in teaching, if I would like to teach. I do workshops occasionally, but I feel like you would have to put on a much different hat than being a writer to be a teacher. So can you talk about that a little bit? Like how, how do you do that? How do you switch out? I really love thinking about other people's stories. Like I said, you know, uh, humans are just fascinating to me. Psychology is interesting. So I really love thinking about just people and the way they work and motivations. And that's a lot of what you do as an editor is helping writers figure out motivations for characters or what happens next or those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's actually really fun for me. The hat switching happens when I start to get so invested in my students' work that I stop thinking about my own. So like I literally wake up some mornings with ideas for other people's stories. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And when I'm really in the throes, like I do full book edits. And when I'm in the throes of a full book edit, if I'm spending a couple of months working on someone else's book, it almost becomes mine. And I'm thinking about how that book is going to be better and I can't work on my own. Mm -hmm. So That becomes sort of an issue for me, which is part of why it's taken me so long to write my next book, because I spend a lot of time invested in other people's books and stories. It's a different hat in terms of like editing is different from writing, obviously. And a lot of writers, I don't know which kind you are, but most writers either love the first draft and hate revising or they Mm -hmm. hate the first draft and they love revising. Mm -hmm. And I hate the first draft and love revising. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) being an editor is like doing the fun part of writing all the time. 
so I actually really like it, but it does require a different sort of brain space, a different kind of attention to the world. Because when I'm writing my books, I'm also thinking about like, I pay much more attention to the world, I think. And when I'm editing, I'm thinking much more about someone else's story, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. No, that does make sense. I do manuscript critiques myself. And when I'm reading someone else's work, I am thinking about it and I will process it while I sleep. Yeah. And so I'll wake up and I'll be like, well, if they tried this, this might fix that. Something's not working and I'm not sure what it is. And then I sleep on it and I get up and I'm like, oh, that's what it is. Especially that unconscious space. It's like, I'm not giving it to my work. I'm not waking up with ideas to fix my book. I'm waking up with ideas to fix theirs. It's a struggle to balance my own writing with that. I love teaching and I love editing and um, I think I'm pretty good at it. And I have a lot of students who are really uh, dedicated and it's so fun to see their progress. I have a student who just sold. I've been working with her for three years and she just sold her middle grade novel in a two book deal to FSG, which is super exciting. So stuff like that is amazing. And I'm so happy for her. And then I have to remind myself, though, that I also... I have a writing career as well. So I think that's the biggest challenge is just that is trying to balance other people's work with my own. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier that you are relying on those diaries again for a new work. So tell us about Mm -hmm. what you're working on now. Ah, So I'm super excited about this book. I don't want to say too much about it. It's a young adult contemporary realistic novel and it's about a girl. So it's sort of a a young couple, these 16 year old boy and girl meet and it's like love at first sight. And they think that everything's going to be amazing. And then they get together and it's just awful and they bring out the worst in each other. And I'm kind of trying to talk about toxic relationships in teenage, not necessarily abusive, but things Mm -hmm. that are like maybe borderline abusive and definitely not healthy and how how you can navigate that when you still really love the person. Yep. So that's that's what I'm thinking about and dealing with. And that's based on a relationship I had in high school with my long-term high school boyfriend. We were together on and off for seven or eight years. And so much of it was awful. And I wish that we had been able to split sooner. So I'm kind of dealing with those, with those issues that I think a lot of teenagers deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm hoping that that's going to be a good book for them. And the other thing I'm super excited about is that it's a journal format. The book oh, itself. I, love that. I loved those when I was a kid Me or when too. I was a teen too. And I haven't seen one of those books in a really long time. I think the closest that I could think of was the perks of being a wildflower, which is letters and not right. journals, but similar idea. No, I haven't seen a journal style one in a long time. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. So I'm trying to finish it as fast as possible. So I get it out before someone else does it. (laughs) Sure. Um, But I, I, I'm hoping that people will like it. I'm about uh, maybe about halfway through right now, hoping to finish this draft by the end of the year. So we'll see. I'm working on that balance again too. Like I, I think over the last few years, it's been really hard to prioritize my own writing. So I'm trying to get back to that. Yep. Tell listeners where they can find you online. MelanieThorne.com, just www.MelanieThorne with an E.com. And um, I'm also on Twitter at Melanie M. Thorne Author, but I, I don't really like Twitter, so I'm not there very much. And <laughs> then I have a face, Facebook page as well and Instagram, um, M. Thorne author, author as well. I have a newsletter and I'm trying to start some more online classes. So if anyone is interested in potentially working with me, they can definitely check out my website. Awesome. Very cool. Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire is produced by Mindy McGinnis. Music by Jack Corbel. A special thank you to fellow authors Alyssa Palombo and R.C. Lewis, as well as patron Stephen Avery for helping to make this episode possible. If you find the blog or podcast helpful, please consider showing your support by visiting patron.podbean.com forward slash writer, writer, pants on fire and making a donation. I'm your host, Mindy McGinnis, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire, where authors talk about things that never happened to people who don't exist.